Welcome to For Formula One's Sake, the podcast F1 deserves. I'm Ollie Peer, and this is the FF1S Preview. We'll be bringing you everything you need to know about the forthcoming Japanese Grand Prix, but not before we've heard from you, the great listening and watching public. If you'd like to grill us on the latest F1 goings on or about Terry's private life, then head to our socials and fire them in. That's all to come. Here comes Listener's Corner, made more difficult by a doddery old Spaniard breaking too early in front of you. Smashy, smashy. Right, who wants to go first? Shall I pick one? Yeah, go for it. I will just pick the first one, which Ooh. is Elaine Malthus-Jones, who Ooh. says, If they red-flagged the race when Russell crashed, would he still be considered DNF? How is it possible that Mercedes did an Alpine and double DNF'd? Well, it's very possible. Neither of the cars finished the race. I think that probably sums it up, doesn't it? Is that um, would, would that happen though if they red flagged it, it? Would he get a DNF? I think because I think if they red flagged it, then it would have ended the race there, and he probably. Well, he well, still on doesn't the it depend when they red red flag it and how many cars have gone past him? Isn't that how it works? Because I think that's why he finished way down or DNF'd because they finished under a virtual safety car, so the cars kept going. They mm. completed the laps and finished the race. And presumably, the transponders they're going. Well, he's still on the track. <laughs> The transporter's yeah. upside down, but he's on the track. I so don't know can't. how that would work. Would it be different? Maybe that's why it? they didn't red flag it. Maybe they went, this sounds like a headache. Let's just, <laughs> let's just do a virtual safety car and cross yeah, off. Yeah. Let's <laughs> risk the fact that he might get killed uh, by, yeah. So uh, I hope that answers your question, Elaine. Uh, we don't know. <laughs> it, that's that's going to be the answer to an awful lot of questions. Yeah. If, you, if you come at us with a genuine technical query. <laughs> yeah. Someone's asked a genuine but we'll question. Have, we'll, have have a, we'll have a guess. We always have a go. How about you, Terry? Which one are you going to go for? I'm going to go for the second question, which is Phil Pitt Matthews says, is it the most Ferrari thing ever that only one of their drivers that's been able to win a race in the last two years is the guy they've already fired? <laughs> I mean, yes. I mean, yes. <laughs> Simple yes. It is. I hadn't thought about it until that question came in, but yes, it's very Ferrari. Because <laughs> apparently Freddie, Freddie Vaseline was being asked about Carlos Sainz and he just like shut the question down. And he was just like, no, no, don't worry about it. We, we got to do his We don't talk about him anymore. <laughs> yeah, who? <laughs> <laughs> Science. Oh, the rally driver. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll carry on the theme. I'll go with the third question. Uh, David Wright, just how much do the stewards read into the data? Clearly Alonso was trying it on with Russell, but when are racing drivers not trying it on with each other? K-Mag's impeding last time out screwed several team races, but that's OK, apparently. I think the difference this time was that K-Mag was just driving defensively. And I'm sure it was annoying for the people behind him, but it wasn't dangerous. He wasn't sort of doing something massively unexpected that could cause them to, I don't know, lose control and end up on the side in the middle of the track. What Alonso did was one allegedly deliberate move that was dangerous and caused, directly or indirectly, Russell to crash. And I think that's why they took such a dim view of it. Driving defensively and making your car really wide is fine it's you know it might not be viewed as particularly sportsmanlike but it's fine it's within the rules you can do that um and it's a skill in itself and as my driving instructor tim mountain used to say that you should never do something that would make another driver slow down swerve or stop there you go there you go thank so you tim broken. mountain what a great fucking name that is <laughs> tim, tim mountain tim mountain great, <laughs> great name Let's... that's like a two two contrasting names in gravitas Tim Mountain. The name's Mountain. Jeremy Tim Mountain. Legend. <laughs> I feel bad. I'm pretty sure that was his name. Um, I wasn't Barry very good. Volcano. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't very good at driving. I'm not sure I was good at taking in his name. But um, You've clearly hey, retained some knowledge, though. Just a little uh, style guide note for our podcast. We will never call him K-Mag again. That's... No. No. No? No. I think we should call all the drivers by that particular style, that template... Elham. Elham. G Russ. <laughs> G Russ. Max V. No. M. No. M. M. Per. S. Per. S. Per. S. Per. S. Per. Okay, right. <laughs> it, really work? it works better for some than others, doesn't it? D. V. Bolt. D. Rick. D. Rick. D. Rick. Derek. Anyway. Um, I was going to say something, I forgot. Let's call him Derek from now on. But the thing is, it's a consistency thing. Because actually, if, if the stewards did apply the rules consistently to everybody always, then. It would be a very different sport. Then hell would have frozen over. But also, I mean, there's been some clips today of like Alonso doing this in 2003 to Raikkonen or something, which I've, I've not even seen the clip, but a lot of people are tweeting about it, which must be true. But it's the thing of when you... When <laughs> no you've tweets got a without career, fire. 
when you've got a career as long as Alonso's, that you can you can prove anything with a clip from a race of his because he's done seven million races. <laughs> Obligatory Alonso clip. Yeah, I guess that works. He's he's literally done everything you could possibly do in racing, apart from except the triple world champion. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Phil um, let's go with Nick Peppel who says when is a driver's time in F1 considered done Hulkenberg, Ricardo, Stroll and others have outstayed their welcome but when exactly is that time in somebody's career I'm gonna say of those three mentioned there Nick I actually think Hulkenberg's been pretty good so far this season oh, and Stroll's not been terrible <laughs> Oh, are you okay, Terry? I just want them all to go. <laughs> <laughs> We've been through this before. You, your whole idea of like, uh, you know, when after after a number of years they're just uh, they're liquidated. Yeah, like I a mean, presidency, I, they just get four years and then that's it. Yeah, I think it? ten years they're allowed. They're allowed ten years and then they have to go. Mm. I think that's a fair, fair. If you've if you've done ten years and you haven't got a podium, Olkenberg, then fuck off. But he's he's doing all right for it. He's not got a car to get a podium. He's never going to get a podium in a Haas, is he? Well, the, the, well, let, well. Then may I ask the next question? Uh, Bomberclat eighty one says, "Who the hell is going to want that second Mercedes seat?" Only Hulkenberg will say yes now. Well, this is a legitimate question. Um, what if Hulkenberg says yes? He's never going to get another fucking podium, is he? Because Mercedes I mean, this, are on their downward the, spiral. Maybe Hulkenberg is the angel of death. If he wants a seat in your car, you can be guaranteed <laughs> that you're not going to get good results. Um, you know, Hulk, Hulkenberg. He's long been known as a really good qualifier, and I think he's proved it. Apart from this race, ironically, but you know he's he's still pretty decent. His number is the reason why he was number one super sub for a few years. He's like if if he's he's not quite good enough to have a full time drive, but if you need somebody, he's your man. Yeah, but should Formula One be about getting through the? Should it be about maximising the best points you can get with any given race with any given car, or should it be about? Something to aspire to for kids. Who aspires to be Nico Hulkenberg, right? <laughs> Who's there going, oh, when I grow up, I want to be just like quite good, but not great at what I do. You know, I just want to be like a middle manager. <laughs> I was thinking this the other day, and I have to a certain extent been playing devil's advocate in this, this conversation. I was thinking this the other day, like there are only 20 normally seats in Formula One. And think about the number of racing drivers there are around the world. I mean, tens of thousands of them at least. Those spots in F1 should only be for people that, not just themselves, but people generally think have a really good shot of being a world champion. And yeah. I think if you get, if you get in, and, and to basically echo your point, Terry, if you get in, it becomes pretty clear that you are not going to be a world champion. Get you should be out. making way for the next person who could be a world champion. It, well, it's interesting, yeah. isn't it? Because it does make you wonder, like, why they do just kind of, yeah, stick at it, and they're just, like you say, just sort of just hovering around, the middle of the pack, middle to the back of yeah. the pack, and just kind of let in it. Fi- it's like, what are you what? doing? Like, what's the Hang point? On, no, 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 in theory, no, no, they no, are no, the best no. of the best of the best of the best. But in Hang practice, on, I'm, then... go- I'm going to have to devil's advocate the other side now because, oh, okay, of course, is going to because if you're Nico Hulkenberg and you get to drive a four to one car and you know earn a lot of money and probably get sucked off by a supermodel then you would wouldn't you because you know as soon as he's not a Formula 1 driver all he's going to have is like after dinner speaking and all that bullshit with some old fusty old dusty men so I, I you know he should be getting his cock wet as long as he can <laughs> The trouble is, and this sorry, is, wet the whistle. I meant I, to but do I didn't a, mean I didn't mean Hulkenberg. Of course, he's he's going to say yes. But I mean the teams oh. as well. Just sort of like generally, it's like well, it, you know, if you're just hovering around there, you you surely just in the middle. Yeah, you, get, what, get you the shit win. teams out. Get the new blood in. Get Andretti I've, in. Get yeah. whoever the fuck else. What's I've happened to Stefan got... Grand Prix? Let's get them back. But this is actually a very interesting point because what's happened in the, since testing has gone into nothing. And since the kind of you know the cars have to last X, X amount longer and the engines have to last longer, it's been seen, or it's been thought that experience is better than raw talent. So actually, it's better to have a Hulkenberg who knows every inch of the car and knows how everything works and knows how to drive a car home and get a points finish and knows mm-hmm. if the race is long and he can finish in eighth, he'll do it. All blah blah blah. But the likes of Oddie Behrman and what's his name, Lawson, and all the other new drivers that have subbed in the last couple of years <laughs> have shown that actually these young new drivers, they're so well versed in the simulators and everything and the Formula 2 and all the rest of it that they can do a good job and they can do a better job than the old fogies. And I say that as a man in my 40s, I think all people in their 40s should stop. But then again, to, to, to play devil's advocate to your devil's advocate playing <laughs> devil's advocate hell. to my devil's advocate, too many devils. the problem with Formula 1, and, and I've talked about this before, 
is that it's not an even playing field. The teams are not all the same. And who knows how many times in the history of F1 we've had the next Max Verstappen or a previous Max Verstappen who has come into F1 and just hasn't been able to get into a good team. True. And has actually been one of the most talented drivers we've ever seen, but we don't know it because, you know, they were in a Simtech or something. Um, it, it is an inherent the, problem with Formula One. You've reminded me of a thought I had when I was a kid, which is way before I did a podcast, and podcasts were even a thing. But it was, I remember someone saying Ayrton Senna was the best driver in the world, and I was just there thinking, how do we know? This is it. <laughs> we need to test all of them. This is it. There was, yeah. there was a, there, I think there was an Onion article I saw years ago. It was like, world's greatest violinist dies having never picked up a violin. <laughs> you know, it's, that, <laughs> it's that kind of thing. It's like... It, the trouble with, with F1, and the great thing about F1 as well, because it is a challenge not just for the drivers, it's for the engineers, it's for everything. To be a great F1 driver, you have to be able to do everything, and you need a hefty old slice of luck. But you need the, you need the diplomatic skills, you need the, the wherewithal to get financial backing, you need to be able to get yourself in the right position at the right time. And it's something that Lewis Hamilton's been very good at. It was something that, that you know Schumacher was very good at. It's something that Alonso's not very good at. You know, He's an incredible driver, but he doesn't have that that skill of being able to be in the right place at the right time and to not burn mm. bridges wherever he goes. And it's why I don't think he'll ever be one of the absolute greats because it's not just about being a good driver. It's the whole package. And whether you like or don't like that is, you know, that's up to you. But that's kind of what F1 is. That's got surprisingly deep for a silly question. Well, good, I, isn't it? But yeah, I it was, had four whiskey, so. That was an actual answer. It was quite good. Um, Henry Haler. Uh, can you guess what race Daniel Ricciardo gets sacked at and the furthest away has to drink Fosters from their shoe? Oh, oh nice. This, this would require us making notes of it and remembering. Um, I'm just trying to find the calendar. Hold on. Schedule. Full schedule. Where are we? It's still quite early. Monica. Yeah. I think they're going to get rid of him. No, hang on. When did they get rid of Liam Lawson? Well, they didn't get rid of Liam Lawson. It's just Ricciardo came back. Oh, no, hang on. No, you're right. I can't remember anything. <laughs> then they got rid of it because uh, Ricardo's hand got better. Yeah. How many races are there this so year? So we've got Japan, China, US, Italy, Monaco, Canada, Spain, Austria, Great Britain. Then the break. Austria. Yeah, I was going to say before, I think before the British Grand Prix. If he's not. I think if they're going <coughs> to do it, they'll do it in the break and he'll be gone by Hungary. So Britain will be his last race. Okay, so we're, I think they'll we're give him. Around. I think they'll give him as long as possible out of deference to the fact that he genuinely used to be quite good. Didn't we all, mate? Didn't we all? Yeah, we all could have been a contender, but aren't in 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 a, in a very real way? Aren't we all Daniel Ricciardo at this time? In a way, I may be a better driver than Daniel Ricciardo. <laughs> I've just only been go karting twice. We think Marion was. Never. I've got the same number of world championships as Daniel Ricciardo. When are you saying <laughs> the break is? Because there's a four week gap between the Belgian and the Dutch Grand Prix. So you sure it's not? Yeah, the British. Oh, they got the break wrong. Normally, it's after the British Grand Prix before Hungary, isn't it? Well, everything's changed. There, there's a, the there's two weeks between those. It's the seventh. Oh yeah, sorry, I was looking at the wrong. Road. Yeah, sorry, it's after Belgium and before the Netherlands. All right, fine. Well, in that case, I'm saying after Belgium, he's gone. After fucking up, there's 14 Grand Prix before the mid-season break. <laughs> oh. Jesus, <laughs> so many. What's going on? That should be two races to go in the season. I know, I know. It's a lot. So angry. It's a lot. Well, well, maybe that. They, I mean, maybe they're just they're just bin him it's off when they Formula start getting to some of the European races. I want my country back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do we have to pick one? Because then, otherwise, you oh, know, we yeah. need to. I'm we saying to... I'm shotgunning whatever the last race before the break was. Okay, so uh, Belgium. No, uh, yeah, Belgium. Uh-huh. Belgium will Austria. be his last race. You're going Austria, saying. and I'm going to go. I'm going to go. Write, go... So I'm going to write it down. Yeah. Right. Okay. And I'll go British. I mean, we're very close there. So, I mean, is that helpful? <laughs> I <laughs> know. So you uh, uh, Britain. Britain. Yeah. Actually, Very put it day. in the Google Doc because we always copy this Google Doc and make a new one. So then I'll, we'll do that I'll write it in longhand first, and then we'll then we'll technify Forget it. About it. What are you saying, Terry? Uh, Austria. All right. And this is th- that will be his last race. Mm, right. Yes. Good. Good. There we go. Hope Can't remember the last time I had a Fosters. Now watch as he turns it around and becomes world champion next year. Right. Oh no. <laughs> Thank you for your questions. Coming up after the ad break, it's Phil Troman's Grand Prix Preview. Uh, remember, you can listen ad-free at The Whinging Moustache, our new subscription. Just sign up through Apple Podcasts, head to our page, and you'll see a link to join. Or you can just say thanks for all the content by donating a one-off pint or three to us at ff1s.com forward slash pint, pint, pint. 
And now, to the land of the rising sun, it's time for the FF1S Grand Prix Preview with Phil Tromans. Konnichiwa, minna, and welcome to the Japanese Grand Prix, the race that means we are getting close to the end of another season. <laughs> Except it's near the start of the year now, because fuck tradition. This is the new Formula One with behind-the-scenes documentaries and scandals involving everyone in charge of everything, so you can shove your tradition up your ass. That approach might be tricky in Japan, though, because if ever there was a country that loved its traditions, it's Japan. Die-hard fans with ornate homemade hats, middling drivers that promise much and then don't really deliver, and manufacturer teams that always pull out just at the wrong moment. No wonder Honda and Christian Horner get on so well. <laughs> <laughs> this year's Japanese Grand Prix takes place at Suzuka, as it has done since 2010, which is weird because it seems way longer. Prior to that, the race was held at the Fuji Speedway, and before that it was held at Suzuka, and before that it was held at Fuji, and so on and so forth. <laughs> Suzuka is one of increasingly few F1 tracks with actual corner names. The first turn is called First Turn, and also includes the second turn. Corners <laughs> 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7 are called the S-curves, apparently coined by some absolute psycho that didn't know when to stop drawing an S. <laughs> Then we have the left-hander at Dunlop Curve because it's quite tiring. Very good. Tire. The Dunlop boring. Are they boring tyres? The no, no, they the make plimp soles. They're amazing. They're tires. They're tires. It's tiring because they're tires. Oh. It's hard work going around the corner because it's tiring. It's a tiring corner. It's tires. Tires. Dunlop tires. Sorry. Fuck's Sorry. sake. <laughs> <sighs> then we go into the two right-handed <laughs> Degner corners, named after an East German motorcyclist who crashed at the track in the 1960s, but after just 50 skin grafts, he was fine. The hairpin curve is so cool because it's a hairpin, while the spoon curve is so cool because it looks like a spoon. <laughs> then you have turn 15, called 130R because it had a corner radius of 130 metres, until Alan McNish and his Toyota had a massive crash there in 2002, whereupon they changed it but didn't change the name. Fuck's sake, Alan, you ruined it. Finally, we have the three corners that make up the Casio Triangle, named after the Japanese electronics manufacturer and so called because it's a good place to watch. <laughs> The race this weekend will be the 49th running of the Japanese Grand Prix and the drivers will tackle 53 laps of the 5.807 km track. The race starts at the much more sensible UK time of 6am, which for parents of young children such as myself is usually getting up time anyway. Mm -hmm. We're hoping there won't be any safety cars because otherwise it could run over into breakfast time and that will cause strife with partners and children that could ruin the entire weekend. When will F1 take this issue seriously? Last year's race was won by Max Verstappen, who also took pole and the fastest lap. This year, as Australia has proved, his dominant victory will depend on whether Red Bull remembers to take the handbrake off his car. Will Red Bull, by which we mean Verstappen, get back on their winning streak? Will Ferrari continue in their failure to Ferrari it all up? Will Mercedes work out how their car works? And will Lando Norris extend his record-breaking run of podiums without a win? The answer to all of those questions is maybe. I enjoyed that. Thank you. Yeah, and I feel like I is learned that true? Something. The Degner is the Degner guy true? I didn't. I've never heard the Degner thing before. Yeah, yeah. It was so you, basically the story was it was an East German motorcyclist called somebody Degner. I forgot his first name. Ralph. Maybe Franz. Let's say Franz. He had a massive crash there. Had fifty skin grafts. Came back. Won the race four times. Oh, good on him. What a legend. Yeah. Yeah. I enjoyed good the corner names. Know. I like uh, literal corner names. There should I be th more. There should. I think be they more. should all be literal. There was a move a few years ago to call one of the co corners Kobayashi Corner for reasons I can't remember. Everyone was well into Kobayashi back in the day. To the oh, point I where I've, I've even got a replica Kamui Kobayashi helmet behind me. So maybe that's the problem with having literal corner names. It could be quite faddish. It could be. Yeah, you, I think you've got, to, you've got to put your name into legend. Which in fairness, in, I mean, in the grand scheme of all the Japanese great drivers, Kobayashi is probably up there. True. No, with no, Takuma I mean this Sato. like 130R. Like, I mean, I, I like that. Like just to, you know, <laughs> they named it after the radius of the corner. The radius of the corner, yeah. Or it seems spoon. a very Japanese thing to do. <laughs> just it looks <laughs> like a it spoon. Looks like a spoon. Yeah. Like, yeah just but more, uh, also, chops yeah, first turn. Is generally <laughs> called first turn. Is that, yeah. that, that, that was racist, wasn't it? I don't well, think do. that was racist. Japanese people do use if chopsticks. We didn't inadvertently do a racism. Well, they should have the spoon curve and then the chopstick straight. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be two straights next to each other. I mean, that would be a feature. Yeah. Like, have a choice of straights. I'd watch <gasps> that. That'd be brilliant. That would be amazing. Yeah. They're both the same length. Mm. It's not It's not like in Formula E where you have to do a... What was it they have to do? Like a shortcut or something? I can't a remember. A loop-to-loop. Rally cross. <laughs> um, it, 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 they'd be the same. The same distance, but you could just choose which one you do. And maybe yeah. there's a tactical advantage somehow. Yeah. I like it. 
Let's write in. Very expensive. I'm going to get my stamped addressed envelope ready. Send it to the FIA. That's it from us. We'll be back next week when we'll be looking back at the Japanese Grand Prix and hoping nothing god-awful happened, unless no one got hurt, in which case it's great content. In the meantime, check out our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash for F1's sake, and follow us on Twitter at for F1's sake. Oh, and please subscribe to our YouTube channel to see what you've just heard in full HD. If you're already watching, then hi. Hi. Hello. Type in for F1's sake to all the usual platforms and see what comes up. Terry, where can people buy merchandise? We have got new merch this year. I've done t-shirts about Toto Wolf being angry. He's always angry. Mm. Uh, we we might have one about Christian Horner if, if I remember. Um, one about Ferrari getting it all wrong because they always get it wrong. And um, <laughs> yeah. pretty sure we've still got Stoffel Ruffle t-shirts if you're old. Um, you can get them all at ff1s.com forward slash shop, shop, shop. And um, if you do buy one, I hope it suits you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should do more retro T-shirts. We could do like Jim Clark T-shirts or something. But like, but shit retro, like not actual. <coughs> oh, no, not, not like not like the actual retro GP places that do really good stuff. Like <laughs> as if we were doing this podcast in the late 60s. Oh. But trying okay. desperately not to make them incredibly morbid and inappropriate. Mm. They would all be morbid and inappropriate yeah. because we'd all have gallows humour. Yeah. <sighs> that would be the theme. Then. Yeah. Thanks for listening. I've been Ollie Pitt. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Yeah. yeah.